is your whole attitude to life? And when you meet somebody, what is your attitude towards them? I don't what? like them. You don't like no. them? No! I mean, if I, I come in here, what's your attitude towards me? No, I have no attitude towards you at all. Why should I have an attitude towards you? I don't even know you. No, but I mean, and it'd be an attitude if you wanted to know me or didn't want to know me. Well, why should I want to know you? I don't know, and that's what I'm asking. Well, I don't know, eh? <laughs> Ask me another question. <laughs> Just give me a reason why I should want to know you. Um, I might be worth knowing. Why? Huh? Why? <laughs> Tell me why. What good is it going to be for me to know you? Tell me. Give me, name me one thing I'm going to gain. Well, you might learn something from my attitude to life. Well, what is your attitude to life? Huh? Well, I can't explain that in two minutes. Well, who are you asking me to explain in <laughs> huh? two minutes? That's all you're getting is two minutes. You're asking me to explain something in two minutes, too. But you're the artist. You're supposed to be able to explain it in two minutes. I am? Yeah. Hey, wow. <laughs> what about you? Aren't you an artist? Oh, no. What are you? I don't know. What? what are I'm you? a science student. Well, let's hear it again. What are you? A uh, what, student? A science student. Now, what does that mean? Now, just what does that mean? Hmm? What does that mean? What do you do? Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Ellis. I am the science student. This was Bob Dylan's UK tour in 1965. I was a student at the time. I was desperate to see Bob Dylan play. But I was a student. I couldn't afford a ticket. So I talked my way backstage on the pretext of going to interview Bob Dylan for the college newspaper. Now, interviewing Bob Dylan was the very last thing I wanted to do because he had a terrible reputation for dealing with journalists. He didn't like journalists, particularly didn't like UK journalists with, with some justification. And in fact, he just announced that he wasn't going to do any more interviews on that tour. So when I asked for an interview, I was pretty secure in knowing that I wouldn't get one. But he called my bluff, and you saw what happened to me. Now, the whole of this tour was filmed, including my encounter with Dylan, and released a couple of years later as a full-length movie called Don't Look Back. Now, you could be forgiven for asking, how did the idiot talking to Bob Dylan in Don't Look Back manage to have a successful career in the music business? Which is a very fair question. I was an English kid from a small town just outside of London. I went to university in the north of England at a place called Newcastle upon Tyne, a, a big city. So I did what small town kids do when they go to the big city. I went nuts. So in my first year at college, I studied beer, I studied girls, and I studied a little science. In my second year, I decided that I ought to wise up and take advantage of the opportunity that I'd been given to get the full college experience. So. I went to the president of the Students' Union in Newcastle. This is the Students' Union in Newcastle, pretty much the same today as it was in 1963. And I asked the president of the Students' Union to give me a job. I said I wanted to, uh, I was a good organizer, I wanted to make a contribution. I wanted to get the full college experience. So he said, well, could you book pop groups into the Students' Union on a Saturday night? He said, the students want pop groups. We, we've never had pop groups before. He said, I don't know how to do it. And I said, well, I don't know either, but I asked you for a job, so I'll give it a shot. So I did my research, and I found that there was a very popular local band in Newcastle called the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo. This is them. So I booked the Alan Price Rhythm and Blues Combo for my first two Saturday nights in charge. They were fantastic. They played all night. I think we paid them 25 pounds. After that, they went to London and they changed their name to The Animals. So my first two Saturday nights in charge, I had The Animals playing for me. Um, I went on and found some other really interesting bands. I booked a band called Jimmy Powell and the Five Dimensions from Birmingham. And they had a really, they had a harmonica player. The guy second from the left up there with a the funny haircut was a harmonica player and his name was Rod Stewart. I also booked a very good blues band from London called the Graham Bond Organization. Now, that's Graham in the front, great blues singer. Um, on the right is his bass player, who's called Jack Bruce. And on the left, his drummer, Ginger Baker. Now, those two guys later met a guitarist called Eric Clapton and formed a group called Cream. 
So you can see that in that first year that I was in charge, I managed to find some great bands. And that year was a great success. Uh, and by the end of that year, I had fallen in love with live music. And I found that I was also in awe of some of the great musicians that I've met. In fact, I just felt I wanted to be part of their lives. So when I graduated, I teamed up with a guy called Mike Jeffrey. Now Mike was a local club owner. He also managed the animals, and he was doing very well. He'd opened an office in London, and he'd just taken on a new management client, a young American guitarist called Jimi Hendrix. So I moved to London into Mike's office, and we started a booking agency together, which, which I ran. And at that point, I came face to face with the hard truth that in a competitive business like the British music business was at the time, that youthful enthusiasm just isn't enough. I had no contacts, I had no power, I had no leverage, and I had a really tough time. And after a year, I wasn't getting enough work for my bands, I wasn't making any money, and I had the humiliating experience of having to admit defeat. I found something that I really liked, I thought I was good at, and I'd failed. And I was absolutely devastated. But I dusted myself off, I had to go and get a job, I worked as a computer systems analyst, and I started a, a part-time business as an agent specializing in booking bands into colleges. And after a year, I found that I was making enough money from my commissions from these bookings that I could give up my day job. So I gave up the day job and I went full time in my little business, one man business, booking bands into colleges. I had a competitor in the north of England, a man called Chris Wright, and he was booking bands into colleges too in the north of England and we met and we joined forces and we formed a company called Chrysalis, which came from his first name Chris and my second name Ellis. And we were booking agents. And we found that we were, since we were controlling the bookings into dozens and dozens of colleges in the UK, we were giving so much work to bands, the bands started to come to us and ask us if we'd represent them. So we began to build up a roster of small blues bands that we represented, many of whom became big blues bands. So we built up this, uh, this roster of bands. And then we had our big breakthrough. We had this tiny little office in the middle of London. And one day, the door burst open. And in came this huge guy, this tall, this wide, great big beard. Hello. My name is Peter Grant. I manage Jeff Beck. Now, Jeff Beck, by this time, was already a legend. He'd been the guitarist in the Yardbirds. And Eric Clapton was the first guitarist in the Yardbirds. And when he left, Jeff joined the Yardbirds. And then Jeff left and formed his own group. And we got a lot of work for Jeff in our colleges, which his manager, Peter, had noticed. And Peter explained that he had Jeff represented by a big agent, the biggest agent in England called Harold Davison, who was also Frank Sinatra's agent. And he said, you know, Frank is not, uh, Harold Davis is not doing anything for Jeff. In fact, I've noticed all his work is coming from you. So he took Jeff Beck away from Harold Davison and gave him to us to represent. Now, we were just a couple of kids out of college with a sort of funky little booking agency. And all of a sudden, a famous manager walks in the door and presents us with a rock god. Well, I mean, we were gobsmacked. <laughs> I mean, um, but we did a great job for Jeff. Uh, now, Jeff had a really good band. Uh, this is Jeff in the front. On the left is Ainsley Dunbar, his drummer. On the right, his bass player, Ron Wood. And at the back, his singer, Rod Stewart. So he had, he had a really good band, but we, we did a, a fantastic job for him. So sometime later, 
Peter Grant came back in the office. Hello, boys. You're doing a great job for Jeff. I've got a new band for you. So he explained that he also managed the Yardbirds. And the Yardbirds were going to break up. They were going to retire. But they had a new young guitarist in the Yardbirds who didn't want to retire. So he was going to form a new band. They were going to call it the New Yardbirds. And Peter was bringing them to us to represent. Peter had taken the first New Yardbirds record to Atlantic Records in New York, who said, this is the best thing we've ever heard, but you've got to change that name. So they changed their name from the New Yardbirds to Led Zeppelin. Now, to me and Chris, you know, we've been in business for a year. We were still fresh out of college. And all of a sudden, we were the agents for the band that was about to become the biggest rock and roll band in the world. I mean, this was pretty heady stuff for a couple of kids. But we were good agents, and we went on and we built Chrysler's agency into quite a substantial business. We were represented a whole list of some of the uh, exciting young bands of the time. But we were really, our hearts were really in management. We really wanted to be managers, and there were two bands on our roster that we really liked, and we became their managers. Chris was managing 10 years after, and I was managing Jethro Tull. <clears throat> and these bands entrusted us with the responsibility of helping them to make a living out of playing music. Now, we had higher dreams for them. We thought these were exceptional, exceptional bands, great live bands with tremendous potential. But in order to realize that potential, we needed a record deal for them. Now, why did we want a record deal? To make money? No, not to make money. You couldn't make money from records in those days. The important thing about a record deal was that the record could get on the radio, the record company would get you newspaper coverage, and you could spread the word about the band. The record was a marketing tool the record company was a marketing company to grow the live performing career of our bands. So we took 10 years after to Decca Records in London, who were one of the biggest record companies in London at the time. Now, this was a period of change in the British music industry. We were going for a period of prepackaged pop to one where the musicality of the artist was more important, where the Lyrics of their songs were more important, where their stage presentation was more important. And the major record companies didn't understand this. You know, they were still mired in the past of the prepackaged pop. They didn't understand a new music movement. So when we took, and we didn't know this, when we, so when we took 10 years after to Decca Records, we didn't understand this. When the 10 years after the first album came out, it was a fiasco. Decca had no idea what they were doing, and it was a disaster. We recovered from that. But when it came to making a deal for Jethro Tull, we didn't want to make the same mistake again. And we understood at that time that there were some young, exciting, independently owned small record companies beginning to crop up. There was a and in America, and there was Ireland in the UK. And we were greatly inspired by Jerry Moss and, and, and Chris Blackwell. And so we formed our own record company. We formed Chrysalis Records. I took Jethro Tull into the studio. I'd never been in a recording studio before. We made the first album. We released it on the Chrysalis label. And it went top 10 in the UK first, first week. So this was a, a pretty exciting start. And here we are. We were in the record business. And so we we recorded some of the other artists we managed and put them out on the Chrysalis label and had some success. But the whole significance of us, the reason we were in the record business was in order to control the marketing of the artists that we managed. We were a management company and our lives revolved around the artists that we managed. So, and, and so much so that we built a group of companies in order to control and protect the careers of the artists we managed. We had 
uh, Chris's agency, I managed. We had a management company. We also managed Procol Harum and Robin Trower and Supertramp. We had a record company. We had a music publishing company. We also were the publishers for David Bowie. We promoted all around concerts, and we ran a theater called the Rainbow Theater. And it came fairly clear to us after a while that in order to satisfy the requirements of the artists we managed, that we had to grow our record company. Specifically, we needed to open up our company in America. So I moved to Los Angeles, and we made a deal with Warner Brothers Records to distribute Chrysalis Records in America. And here we are with the, uh, the Warner Brothers team, the guy on the front right, the head of Warner Brothers, the legendary Mo Austin, the guy above him, the bearded wonder, is my partner, Chris Wright, and the really good-looking guy at the front with all the hair. <laughs> we subsequently, when our deal with Warner Brothers expired, we took Chrysalis Records completely independent in the United States, and that allowed me to sign Blondie, Billy Idol, Pat Benatar, and Huey Lewis in the News. And by 1985, Chrysalis Records had become one of the most powerful and successful independently owned record companies in the world. But, but those are the old days. And people today say to me, what do you think about today's music business? You know, with the internet and with digital downloads and declining record sales. The music business seems to change out of all recognition. It seems to be in trouble. And I say, no, 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 no. The music business hasn't changed. The music business is about artists getting on a stage, musicians getting on a stage and, and entertaining people. That hasn't changed. And that business is as strong as it's ever been. So that's not in trouble. The music business isn't in trouble. The record business may have changed. And the record industry may be in trouble. And it's important to understand the distinction between the two. In the 70s, the, music exec the executives of the major music companies decided that they were so important that the words music business and record industry were interchangeable, which they are not. They're two different businesses. The music business is the business of musicians. Musicians make music. Record company executives sell records. They're two businesses. And to really understand the difference, you need to look at the history. The music business is thousands of years old. The earliest musical instruments that archaeologists have discovered have been dated at 40,000 years old. These are whistles from prehistoric California. This is a flute made out of the bone in the wing of a bird. This is from Germany, dated at 35,000 years old. So the likelihood is that musicians have been entertaining for tens of thousands of years. We, we, we certainly know we can go back 2,000 years, and we know that in the days of the Roman Empire, musicians were entertaining at weddings, at funerals, and all kinds of feasts, and were, were greatly respected and well remunerated. And also in the, the Egypt, time of the Egyptian empire. So the music business is thousands of years old. The record industry, on the other hand, is a new business. It's a little baby in comparison. The, the first phonogram was only invented 130 years ago. The first record came along 100 years ago. And the modern record industry, maybe 60 years old. So it's, a, it's an infant. Now, how did these two businesses come together? Well, if you go back to the 30s and the 40s, the pop groups of the time were dance bands. The star musicians of the time led dance bands. People like Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller. If you wanted to see Glenn Miller play, you lived in Baltimore, you went to the Hippodrome Ballroom. Now, record companies recorded some of these bands and sold their records to, to fans. Now, this was 
really important to these bands. Why? Because you know, they lived on the road. They, they were touring bands. And if Glenn Miller went to Baltimore to play at the Hippodrome Ballroom, he might not be back there for another three months. And he would be concerned maybe about it, that his fans would forget him. But if the fans could go out the following day and buy a record and take it home and play it at home, it was no substitute for the real thing, but at least it could keep the memory of the music of Glenn Miller fresh in their minds until he came round and played again. So this was really important to, to the band, very important. It was, so the record wasn't just a souvenir, it was a, a promotional item that helped their live performing career. And then record companies found that if they got their records played on the radio, they could sell more copies. And the bands found that when their music got played on the radio, more people came to the gigs. And that was really important to them, because the more people that came to the gigs, the more money they got paid. And that's how they made their livelihood. So having a record deal was really important to them. Again, not to make money, they didn't get royalties. They got paid for the recording date, but they didn't get royalties, and they didn't care. Because having that record out was crucial to them, because the record was a marketing tool. The record company was a marketing company for their live performing career. Of course, as time went on, record sales increased and record companies did start to pay, to pay royalties. But if you skip forward a couple of decades to the period of the, of the pop groups, bands like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds with Eric Clapton, these were live performing bands and making a living playing in clubs and doing well. But they wanted record deals too. They wanted a record deal for the same reason, not to make money. You couldn't make money from records in the 60s. They wanted a record deal to promote their career. They got that record out, they could get it on the air, on radio, they could get newspaper coverage and spread the word about them and, and, and grow their career to them again. The record was a marketing tool. The record company was a marketing company. But then something really strange happened. The golden era of music of the 60s and 70s paved the way for a phenomenal increase in the sales of records. So between 1985 and 2000, record sales tripled. I mean, that's staggering. Tripled between 85 and 2000. Now, what did this mean? Well, <laughs> this was very good news for the record companies because it meant that the record business was a really good business to be in. And it was good news for the performing artists too because all of a sudden they were getting a nice bonus every six months when they got a royalty check. And it also created a new profession, the recording artist. Now, what is a recording artist? A recording artist is someone who makes so much money from record royalties, from merchandising, from endorsements, that he doesn't need to set foot on a stage. Now, something even stranger happened in the year 2000. As fast as record sales had gone up, they started to go down again. Between the year 2000 and 2010, record sales halved. And by now, we're approaching 1985 levels again. Now, why is this? Well, we have a new environment. We have a new environment created by new technology. Now, there's nothing new about new technology. We've been adapting to new technology since the wheel was invented. The record industry itself was created by a piece of new technology when the phonogram was invented. So in every business, in every walk of life, companies have to adapt to new technology. I mean, you adapt or you die. New technology creates new opportunities for development and growth and new profits. But in order to take advantage of those opportunities, Companies in every, in, in every field need to understand that the environment is also being changed by new technology. 
and they have to adapt, quite possibly adapt their business model in line with the developments in the environment through new technology. Now, a very good example of somebody who did not adapt to new technology is Kodak. Kodak were one of the pioneers of photo imaging, developed tremendous amount of expertise in the business of photo imaging, and built a huge company with the business model revolving around sales of photo film. A huge business. At one point, and they dominated the industry. At one point, they, had, they controlled 90% of the US market for photo film. Huge. Then digital technology came along, which they had a role in developing. But they were so complacent about their position that when sales of photo film started to go down, they sat on their hands and waited for this novelty to go away. And by the time they realized that this novelty was not going away, it was too late. And a couple of years ago, Kodak went bankrupt. Staggering. Meanwhile, their biggest rival, Fujifilm, who had the same dominant position in Japan, saw the writing on the wall much earlier. And they adapted their business model to allow for sales of things, other products other than photo film. And today, Fujifilm is a thriving and, and, and growing business. And we have a new environment in the music business today. The internet has created all of these new media, lots of new places for people to listen to music. And all the evidence is that people are listening to music today more than they ever were. And they're more interested in music than they ever were. And in fact, the statistics show that in the period as record sales have declined, the revenue created by the sales of tickets to shows has increased. So what the public is telling us is, hey, we're just as interested in music as we ever were, probably more. We just would prefer to spend the money in our budget for music on tickets rather than records. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is not good news for the record companies. The record business is not as good a business to be in as it was. And if they were smart, they'd find, they would find a new business model. For the recording artist, it's not good news, because those record royalties have, have gone. And they need, to start to learn, they need to start to learn to perform and perform really well, otherwise their career is over. For the performing artist, it's good news. Their record royalty sales may, record royalties may not be as, 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 as big as they were, but their core business of performing is more secure than it ever was. It's a bigger business than it ever was. So it's good news. And for the new musician, it's good news. For the up and coming, the aspiring musician, it's good news. The music business is an exciting place to be in, as long as they change their business model. Now, musicians in their late teens, early 20s, were born into a period of massive record sales. So it's understandable that they may have a business model which, in which they anticipate making a substantial part of their income from record royalties and the rest of it from performing. They have to understand that these, we live in a different era. It's a new day. Those massive record sales are over. It's finished. In fact, in 50 to 100 years, people will be looking back and they'll be talking about the bubble of 2000, when record sales went up and then went down again. So the new musician has got to adapt to this new world, create a new business model where 100% of the income is coming from live performance. And sure, if he becomes very successful, there may be a, a bonus from some record royalties one day. But in the meantime, he has to get out and take advantage of all the new opportunities that the internet has brought along to get his music heard. Because if he doesn't get his music heard, he has no career. And he just has to get used to the idea that 
The record is not a place to make money any longer. It's a marketing tool. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> well, it should, because generations of musicians prior to the 80s, to them, the record was a marketing tool. And we've come full circle. And the record is a marketing tool once again. So the new business model is the same as the old business model for musicians. And I would say to young musicians this. There are, music business is a really exciting business. It's a bigger business, a better business than it ever was. There are too many of you who are thinking of the music business as a place where you get a lucky break and become rich and famous. Instead of focusing on the joy of playing music and the thrill of getting on a stage and entertaining. And let's face it, the music business is incredibly competitive. And your chance of success, let's be real, is very small. However, if you have a unique talent, you have a chance of success. If you're prepared to work really, really hard, you have a chance of success. If you're prepared to put every ounce of your energy and every waking minute of every day into becoming a better musician, a better singer, a better songwriter, a better performer, then you have a chance of success. If you become really, really good at all those things, then you have a chance of success. And if you get some success, then you have a chance of becoming rich and famous. But if you become rich and famous, it'll be because of your talent and your hard work, not because you got a lucky break. As you can tell, I, <laughs> I love music, I love musicians, I love the music business. Uh, music business has been very good to me. It's given me a great life. It's still giving me a great life. I, I, I live on a, a mountaintop in paradise in the Caribbean. I have new activities that I'm really excited about. I'm writing a book about the music business. I'm developing a stage musical with Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull based on his Aqualung album. And I've, I've started to talk about music like this. And I really enjoy talking about the music business, and I've really enjoyed talking to you this afternoon, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph, do we have any time for questions? I think it would be a great idea to pose some questions to Terry, and Terry, if I can start by asking you this. One of the key factors that you concentrated on for so many years was the very essence of artist development. Some people talk today about a and &R being i and &R, innovation and repertoire. What's your view about what should be done today with artist development, the core of developing the song, the artist, the music, those elements that the artist then performs live? I really think that I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I was a manager. I'm still a manager at heart. I really believe that a manager is incredibly important to an artist's career. Um, I would encourage any artist to, to find a manager. You've got to find the right guy. And, and the key to me in management, and the key to finding the right person, you need someone who's going to be honest with you. Because you, know, you need to improve whatever you do. And you know, the people who come to your shows, that come backstage afterwards, will tell you how wonderful you are. They won't tell you what was wrong. They won't tell you, I didn't really like that second song. Or, you know, they won't tell you that. Uh, what you need is somebody who, that you trust, that we can evaluate what you're doing and tell you where you're going wrong and tell you if you're going wrong. Because otherwise, you're on the stage, you have no idea. You're doing your best up there. You don't know how it's coming over. You need someone to guide you and advise you. And finding that person is difficult because there aren't I used to think that all managers had that talent. Well, they, I, I recently discovered they don't. Uh, there are some managers who really are clueless 
um, when it comes to guiding their artists. You know, they may be good at booking dates and picking up their commission, but they're not that good in giving you the advice that you really need to develop your career. So you're saying that <clears throat> a manager might be good at booking live dates, but is it the record company's responsibility or the label's responsibility to help shape the material? Um, I don't think so. I think that, the, again, I think the manager is the most important person. Um, and I think too much, has been, uh, too much emphasis has been, has been placed on the, the role of the record company. And the fact of the matter is that record companies, you know, when sales went up, they became very powerful and very rich and were able to pay big advances and, and also you know, fund the development of artists. So their role became very, very much emphasized. But you know, I, I personally doubt the quality of the advice that record companies have been given. Uh, and really, you know, the most important, uh, clearly the most important person in developing an artist's career is the artist himself. And, peop and very few people are that close to the artist that they can give them that truth, that, that the truth that they need. And I don't think even the, the best artist development person isn't the person who is going to get an artist in a corner after a show and say, hey, you were terrible. I mean, you'd get fired from record companies. The artist would go, go to the, record, the president of the record company and say, hey, your guy in artist film told me that I was terrible. He'd get fired. So I, I don't think you can rely on the record company. So Terry, if I can ask one more question before we open it to the floor. You developed the career of Blondie, an incredible artist who's had a career that's lasted years. With some of those very big hits of Blondie, what role did you play in guiding and shaping and advising on the material that were, was, was used as the singles that led an album? I think the, the most significant part, really, that I played in the development with Blondie was that I saw the potential you know, very, very early on. They, Blondie were initially signed to a company called Private Stock, a small independent company in New York. And I lived in Los Angeles, was running Chrysalis, and I lived with a woman called Marilyn Grabowski, who was the West Coast photo editor for Playboy. Hell of a job. <laughs> and she came home one evening and said, you know, I met this amazing girl today. You know, she's in a punk, punk rock band from New York. The band's not doing really well, but she is amazing. And she brought home all these photographs of, of Debbie Harry and cuttings from punk rock magazines and, and a copy of the album. And I looked at all these photographs and I said, Marilyn, this girl's a star. And I became <coughs> obsessed with Debbie Harry. How did you know she was a star? Could it just jumps, It jumps you off the page, Ralph. You know, it jumps off the page. You just look at it and you go, this girl's a star. You know, this was, this was my Marilyn, you know. And I just became obsessed and, you know, through a, a series of events, I was able to buy the Blondie contract from private stock. We paid a half a million dollars in uh, 1977. A lot of money. Um, and a half a million dollars, well, you know, it still sounds like a lot of money. 1977, it was a huge amount of money, especially for a little independent record company. Uh, but I just had all the belief in the world. Uh, and again, again, the most important thing there, getting kind of back to your question, is that I introduced Blondie to Mike Chapman. Mike Chapman was a good friend who had a history of big, big pop records in England. And he was desperately trying to be active and, and successful in America. And I introduced Mike Chapman to Blondie, and that was a sort of marriage made in heaven. Because he brought a pop sensibility that they really wanted. And they brought you know, interesting music, interesting ideas. And um, I remember Mike telling me that he, he was just fascinated with Debbie, because she said she would write the lyrics of the songs in the studio, lying on the floor in the corner, scribbling, and, and would come up with these amazing lyrics, you know? And when you work like somebody like that, with that talent, it's just so inspiring. We have a mic. If you could just tell us your name, and where you're from. <clears throat> uh, my name is Walter, I'm from Windsor, Ontario. Uh, 
I saw a quick question about songwriting. What's the best way to get into writing for labels, and how do you approach it? What kind of means or venues do you have to take? What's the best way to present yourself as a songwriter? Well, you know, the, the, I suppose the difficult way is you just have to flog your songs around and take them to, I guess, to A and R men, you know, who are putting records together and, and offer them, you offer your songs to them. Maybe the easiest way is to hook up with a publisher, but to find an old style publisher because, you know, so too many of the publishing companies today are just banks that administer and collect money. The old style publisher was like an agent for a songwriter, someone who loved the songwriter loved the songs and would take them around and introduce them with love and passion to producers and a and men and artists and try and persuade them that these were the songs that they should, they should produce. So, you know, there's, those are two different ways, but if you hook up with a publisher, you know, make sure you've hooked up with somebody who loves what you're doing. Um, do you think that possibly, uh, well, the new model being the old model, and reverting back to the independent label, that that's also part of the um, the old model that uh, you know we're no longer four or five major labels, we're down to three, and the independents are very important. And those are the people that sort of cared about their artists and were willing to work with their artists. Uh, do you think that that's also part of that whole package of the new is uh, old? I I think so. I, I mean, I've been a bit disappointed. You know when. The music, when the internet really changed the environment, um, you know, it, it seemed to me very much like a period of, uh, in the mid-60s, and that, that when I came along, you know, where the major labels had no idea what was going on, and allowed new companies like A&M and Island and Chrysalis you know, to, to come along because they understood the artist, they understood the music, they understood where the future was going. Uh, and most importantly, as you say, they loved the music, they loved the artists. And I kind of expected when the internet revolution came along and it was clear to me that the major labels were kind of being left behind and didn't understand what was going on, I expected that there'll be a whole new crop of, of, of labels like a and and Island and Chrysalis that, that came along. But that hasn't happened and I've been a bit disappointed. But I think what I'm, what I'm seeing now is that the managers are becoming the record men. The managers are advising the artists. And the, the managers can see that you don't need a record company. I mean, the, the record, one of the, the reasons the record companies did so well was that the, in, the old, in the old business model, the record company controlled the gateway. You know, if you produced music, if you wanted your music on the radio, you had to go through a record company because the record companies had the armies of promotion men that had the links to the radio stations. So they controlled the avenue to the radio station. So if you wanted your record on the air, you had to go to a record company. Similarly, if you wanted to sell your record, your record had to be in a record store. And the record companies controlled access to the record stores through their massive distribution systems. Well, all that's changed. You know? If you've got music, you can get your music up. You can get it, you know, anybody can get their music on, on YouTube. You create your own websites. There are all these you know, social media, that, that all these opportunities for getting your music uh, up there and available to be heard. Getting it heard, of course, is another matter. Uh, similarly, you, know, you don't need access to a record store any longer. Anybody can get them, put their music up on iTunes. So if someone wants to buy it, they can go and buy it easily. So, the record company isn't controlling access to the business any longer. And I think managers are coming along, smart managers who are saying to their artists, you know, we don't need a record company. We can do all this ourselves. <coughs> and, and there appear to be those kinds of individuals and, that are, as you say, create, populating the new, the new business model. It's Pat Silver. I co-manage Countermeasure Acapella out of Toronto. It's a group that has just released the first album. My question was, is, do you think they should concentrate on cranking out a lot of records or on touring uh, in their first couple of years? What's, what's the most important thing in terms of creating visibility and a career? Play, 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 and more play. 
you know, the ultimate, ultimately, you're going to make your money playing in front of people. The, the audience is the ultimate arbiter of taste. You know, and, and I think a very important thing for a developing band is that the audience can teach them more than anybody else, more than the manager, more than the A&R man, because the audience will tell them whether they like them or not. You know? And so, and you know, the fact of the matter is, as I was saying earlier, you, you're not going to make any money out of records any longer. You, know, you, you need to get in front of an audience, you need to develop your show, uh, and tour as much as you can. Let's uh, go to this uh, young lady here. Should it matter to be someone you know personally, or just like a complete stranger maybe that you met and they say, oh, I'm a manager, like, and you guys talk business and so on? Like, what should the like, first relationship be? Should there be one or should there not be one? I, d I don't think it really matters. You know, the most important thing is, to, is for the artist to find someone they trust. Um, and if that personal relationship isn't going to get in the way of the professional relationship, it seems okay to me. I mean, the likelihood is if it becomes a strong professional relationship, maybe the personal relationship will, will go by the wayside, but that's kind of the way that life is. Um, and, you know, you, you, your relationship with your artist, a manager's relationship with the artist, is a professional one and not necessarily one of, one of friendship, it's one of, of honesty and professional uh, expertise. So, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a barrier having that friend. It just has to be someone who's good at what they do and fulfills your requirements of being good at what they do and, and being someone you can trust and someone who's honest.